Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for the power of God. Thank you for this service, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that abides. We thank you, Lord, that we can appropriate it this morning for this hour of need. Let the mighty power of the Holy Ghost touch every heart, every listener. Let no one leave this service this morning without being moved. Move us, Lord, until there is a reaction in all of our hearts to the mighty word of the Lord, the quickening power of God. We know that you are here, you abide, and you're with us now. Every word that proceeds out of our mouth this morning shall bring glory to his matchless name. Amen. Power over sin. I have an unusual kind of respect for the word sin. The same kind of respect I have for a rattlesnake coiled for an attack. For over eight years now I've ministered the very gates of hell and I've seen every variety of sin there is and I've wept my way through human graveyards of depravity and hopelessness. My congregation has already been to hell and back. Those that I minister to walk only at night, and their only consolation is that there are so many others just like them. Sunshine to them is painful. Life is a dreaded ordeal. Pleasure is only another form of pain. Death is a desired haven, a way out of bondage and total demon possession. My parish, of course, is the gutter. The big people here are the drug addicts, the burglars, the muggers, the alcoholics, the gangs, the debs and dolls, and the con artists. None of them very old in years, but all of them old in misery and pain. This is a world where the little people are born old. Children are conceived in the hates and shames and sins of their parents. Their tender little bodies become their enemies, used only to feed them drugs, disease, and liquor. They cry when they're born without any hope of being heard by men. They are born wishing they were dead. They are born to sin-cursed parents who spend every nickel on fifths of whiskey instead of quarts of milk. They land in the street jungle because it's better there than in their home. Hell to them is home. Satan rules supreme in the world that we minister to. The other half, he entices the young and the innocent. He enslaves them with appetites and habits that break down their morals, their health, and their integrity, waste their energies, and dissipate their strength and power, leaving them nothing but the pitiful wages of sin, death. Little skinny Carlos is a point in case, case in point. Seventeen-year-old boy that I met in a basement, 110th Street in Harlem. He had never in his 17 years seen the Brooklyn Bridge, though he lived in Brooklyn, uh, in uh, Harlem. He'd never been down to see the Brooklyn Bridge. Never been out of a 20-some block area in all of his life. His mother had left him when he was 14 years of age, and he moved into a basement. He was allowed to stay in that basement by firing, stoking the furnace. And I went down to look at his little room. I was shocked, and I've seen plenty. He had an old urine stench mattress on, right on the dirty floor. There were no doors or windows in that basement, and the cold came rushing through there in the winter. Rats. He had a little calendar, three years old, hanging on the wall, a little picture of his mother and an old burnout candle. A few rags that he used for blankets. The boy ate only what he could steal, a bag of oranges, a loaf of bread. He had a little needle, a set of works underneath the little stone. He sat there day after day, shooting narcotics into his vein and living his little world. The boy hadn't bathed in months, and I don't suppose he'd changed his clothes in at least three months. I was so shocked, I forced him to come to the center. We made him take a shower, we cleaned him up, gave him good clothes. Talked to him about the Lord, but he was so stunned he couldn't uh, understand. When I went down to the office later, about one o'clock in the morning, to finish some work, I felt rather warm inside that I could provide clean sheets, a nice bed, good clothes, and comfort for a boy who'd been sleeping in a basement. Two o'clock in the morning, a blood-curdling stream, and Carlos 
ran streaming down our halls and outside the door he hadn't even had his shirt on yet. He was naked from the waist up and carrying his shoes. Ran streaming down the street and disappeared. The next day I went over to find him. I saw him in a little candy store. I said, Carlos, what's the matter? He said, Pastor, you took my only security. This is the only life I've known. He said, you took it away from me. I had to come back. I can't stand it anywhere else. Skinny Carlos died two months later of hepatitis in the Queen's Hospital. I haven't forgotten that boy because Satan stripped him and left him nothing. Daisy, young lady I talked about last night, a prostitute, a narcotic addict, 32 years of age, came to live with us at Teen Challenge Center, walked out against advice. Because of constant drilling in her veins, her surface veins collapse. When it happens, they shoot in the leg, and then when those surface veins collapse, they shoot in the jugular vein and in the breast. Daisy had walked out against advice, warned that I would bury her if she didn't obey the Holy Spirit. Daisy was prostituting two months later on a rooftop, 110th Street and Madison Avenue. And she got $2 for her trick, as we call it. A drug addict later found she had that $2, chased her back up on the roof and demanded the money. She wouldn't surrender to him, and he pushed her off the roof, and she fell on the pavement, cracked her skull, and died instantly. He went down and took the two dollars from the corpse because Satan wouldn't even let her go into eternity with two dollars in her purse. Fernandez was paid in full on the rooftop in the Bronx, and I told about this to the young people last night. Five teenage boys shooting narcotics. Sixteen-year-old Fernandez died from an overdose. They tried to stick saltwater needles in his veins to shock him, beat him over the head with wet tiles, he still passed away. The next day, they're walking the street trying to work an angle. They had no money for a deck of heroin. Remembered the corpse laying up on the rooftop, stretched up against the stairwell. They went up and stripped him of his clothes, stripped the corpse, took it to a pawn shop, and got six dollars for his clothes and left him naked. Because Satan wouldn't let Fernandez go into eternity even with the clothes on his back. This is the world that we work in, a world of sexual deviation, overrun with homosexuals and lesbians, thousands of sad and lonely people who live normal lives most of the week, but suddenly at the weekend they're overwhelmed by a power from another world that sets them apart from all other creation. They are marked with a sin and a corrupt streak that drives them to depths of sin and filth that our decent minds cannot even comprehend. They are driven to alcoholism, to mental institutions, and so often to suicide. I received the most indecent mail of any minister in the world. My own mother has had to answer my personal mail because we cannot even trust anyone else to open the mails that come to me. From men and women all over the world who detail their obsessions and their deviant lives and life patterns. These pitiful letters break hearts at our center. My mother has blushed many times. Tragic stories of bondage, demon possession, satanic attacks, obsessive habits. Stories from laymen and ministers from many nations around the world who beg for our prayers and deliverance. Prostitutes who wet their tears, or their letters with their tears. Homosexually bound ministers who threaten suicide unless they can be set free once and all from their sin. Drug addicts who write jail epistles about the physical torture of cold turkey. Who make sad and pitiful appeals for one last chance before they commit suicide. Friends, the sin cult that I'm talking about even now plagues the church of Jesus Christ. Our religious and secular campuses, colleges, Bible schools, and almost every Christian stronghold today, Satan has come down having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. I've been lecturing in some of our Christian campuses around the country, and this year has been one of the worst disciplinary problems in the history of our schools. Our own schools, Pentecostal, Methodist, and, and I, I can name some of the outstanding schools, Christian schools of our nation, for the first time in their history, are having problems that they can't even, can't even begin to control. Now, I've expected drinking, cursing, sexual promiscuousness, and deviation of every kind in the gutter where I preach, but now it appears that these same problems are causing many Christians to lose their first love. 
While the church has slept, the enemy has crept into soul tears. There is now winking at sin, no more concept of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Now, I expect things to get much worse in the parish that I am called on to minister to. It'll get worse and worse through time because God's word predicts it. Second Timothy 3.13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The government with all of its millions and medical knowledge will not stop drug addiction. I predict that thousands of more will become addicts each passing year. I was just telling the young people last night that one of our major problems in New York City right now are the numbers of teenagers are going through the high school corridors unscrewing the little caps from the fire extinguishers and getting high on its chemicals. Licorice now they find is addicting, habit forming, and they're going to have to outlaw licorice. Because kids are discovering that if you take enough of it, you can get it high. More prostitutes will sell their body and soul. Skid rows will become overcrowded. Teen gangs will continue to terrorize and rumble from city to city. Civil disobedience is going to spread. Disrespect for law and order will be rampant. Thrill murders are going to increase. Sexual deviates will prowl more and more streets, raping and abusing more and more helpless women. Crime is going to go out of control completely. College campuses will not be peaceful and calm again. They will boil over with a new kind of liberalism, extensionalism, extens, well, anyhow, existentialist, existentialist. I remember preaching at, uh, just pardon me a minute here, where is it, Berkeley campus, out on Sproul Hall during the riot. They said they'll stone you. The communists and all their followers were over here screaming and hollering through the microphones. I stood up to speak and young people took their hats off. There were some 12 to 1,500 young people standing around with their hands folded. And I'd never seen anyone so respectful in all my life. And I wondered what it was and I turned around. So happened the Teen Challenge Center there had brought along about five or six great big husky converted drug addicts who stood behind me with their hands on their shoulder. I would have listened too. I was in Buffalo, New York uh, for crusade and downtown in the city square I saw a group of kids, you know these shaggy kids who iron their hair and wrinkle their clothes. Marching around the city square, band of bomb, one sign read, Johnson's a liar, get out of Vietnam. Right in the middle of a little kid had a for sale sign. And to me that described what was happening to our young people today. Just anything to try to show some spirit of rebellion. This will increase. And mark it down, and you're going to hear it this morning from this pulpit, you mark it down well. If it doesn't happen this summer, it'll happen next summer, and I believe it will happen this summer. We're going to have the greatest revolution, the most vile, violent race revolution the world has ever witnessed. It will start this time in Washington, Baltimore, Detroit, Oakland. These are the cities that are going to get hit the hardest, including New York. Los Angeles will have other outbreaks, perhaps not as serious. But this will spread throughout the United States, and we're going to see. It hasn't even begun, my friends, because this is the sword of the Lord in the land. God has allowed it. This is the doing of the Lord. When a nation sins grievously against me, the Lord said, I will move against it with the sword of my hand. Bishop Pike and Bishop Robinson Incorporated and all these pipsqueak bishops will lead their herd of agnostic ministers deeper and deeper into the pits of confusion, sin and rantings and ravings against the cherished truths of the Orthodox Church. Liberals will be making pilgrimages to Rome to bend their knee to the power of the Pope. Backslidden Pentecostals and evangelicals will busy, be busy working more and more angles, getting involved in more and more red tape trying more and more orthodox procedures that have already proven unworkable, 
send out more and more slogans, dream up more and more paper evangelism, and stray further and further away from the simple, uncomplicated dreams of the fathers who founded their movements. God's Word predicts it. Movies will get dirtier and more descriptive. TV shows will compete for vileness and freedom to satisfy the sex-satiated generation of the United States. Newsstands will brazenly peddle smut written by demons and devils. Divorce laws will be eased, and the home life as we have known it will be ridiculed until it becomes acceptable to maintain mistresses and to indulge in extramarital relationships. It will become almost normal for college students to maintain sexual affairs while in school to keep up with the crowd. Moral standards are decaying, and now dishonesty, cheating, lying, and stealing has become a way of life. And God's Word predicts it'll get worse. More and more of our church kids will get pregnant. Others will lose the fire and backslide. Others will live phony lives and hide behind double standards. But in the midst of it, persecution will get hotter and hotter. Become more and more difficult to live a really overcoming life. Intellectuals will scoff and cry, come on over and set yourself free from your Puritan attachments and background. Intelligent Christian youth will seek to become relevant rather than repentant. They will become involved, but instead become entangled. God's word predicts it. All I hear today is about a church that needs to be relevant. God's word said it needs to be repentant. We talk about being involved and instead we get entangled. I have never yet once seen a preacher who heads a civil rights demonstration stop the crowd and preach the gospel. And, and I just don't care what they think of me. Pastor, if you're going to march in a civil rights demonstration, stop the crowd, go ahead and march, but preach Jesus first. Then march. Never have we needed, and I have painted this picture, and I believe it's true, I have not overstated it, and all you have to do if you think I've overstated is to take a little tour with me through our major cities and see that I have understated it, if anything. But we have never so desperately needed a definition of power over sin as we need it now. In the past few months, I have literally been driven to my Bible for a definition of power over sin. I have to have answers. The people that I work with have to have an immediate answer. They have to have help and deliverance right now. Never have people fought such great inner battles as they fight today. The question I'm asked most in the gutter, in crusades, must I give in to this thing that has me in its grip? Is there no power over sin in my life? Do I have to go through the rest of my life as a cripple, obeying the impulses of my lower nature? A husband sat in my office with his face in his hands crying a few weeks ago. A lovely wife and two beautiful children. He'd been converted for five years and he'd been seeking after God. But suddenly he turned to alcoholism. In fact, the night he reverted to alcoholism, he burned a bar down and hit the headlines. Came into my office, I said, why did you do it? Five years you were clean. He bowed his head and he wept. He said, Brother Dave, five years ago I had a secret sin. He named it his homosexuality. He said, I tried to overcome it. It lay dormant. Suddenly it overpowered me and I was so depressed. I went out and got drunk and I burned a bar down, told me the whole story. He looked up at me with tears streaming down his cheeks and he said, Brother Dave, is there no victory? Is there no power over this thing? Do I have to be a slave the rest of my life? He said, if that's true, I want to end it all now. A much used evangelist from Denmark came to my office greatly used of God, reaching thousands of souls. He said, David, ten years ago, I was an alcoholic, and I had the same problem that I mentioned to you just now. He said, God delivered me, filled me with the Holy Spirit, and I have won thousands of souls. He said, for ten years, I've moved in God. He sat there trembling, he said, three weeks ago, Strange spirit came over me and I found the old desire had overwhelmed me and I stood in a pulpit and suddenly that craving, that desire hit me so hard. He said, I've come all the way from Denmark. I've read your book. 
You're the only man I think could help me, said Brother Dave, and he stood. Though I've preached and though I've known all about the movings of the Holy Spirit, he said, I have no power over this. I'm driven like an animal, and unless I can get victory, I've got to quit preaching. And if I have to do that, suicide is next. And I get letters from all over the world. I watch drug addicts as they leave us and revert to their old life, and I see them on the street. They cry and read their Bibles half the night. They say, I can't help it. I'm on a toboggan slide. I'm going down and I can't stop it. You know, we have thousands of Christians around the world who fight a battle constantly. They have never had a definition of power over sin in their lives. They're buffeted and they're tossed by every little wind and wave of temptation. Told of burying Danny last night. Danny walked out, shot through the heart by a police officer. We buried him three weeks ago. I remember talking to Danny on the street before he was murdered. He'd say, Brother Dave, how can I get power over this craving for drugs? Why didn't God set me free when I got on my knees and prayed? Why didn't God take the desire away? He said, it's still there and I can't help it. He said, I don't want it. I despise it. I hate it, but I can't stop it. Don't think for one moment that only drug addicts and homosexuals fight this horrible battle against sin in the soul. It's the battle of every great man of God. It's your battle and it's mine. I know what it is to pray for a crucified life. And by the way, it's not scriptural to live a crucified life. Crucifixion is an act. You live the resurrected life. And I'm tired of people telling me they're living a crucified life. They've never even been able to say it is finished. The act of crucifixion is finished when you can say with Christ at the cross, it is finished, and then give up the ghost. I do not live the crucified life. I live the resurrected life, and the same quickening power that raised Jesus from the dead is in me. Hallelujah. And I live the resurrected life. Why don't you join me? I can give you the day. I can give you the day. I screamed in my little prophet's chamber, it is finished. And I've been preaching the sermon ever since God's not given anymore. He gave it all to Calvary. How could God give you something again? He already gave you. He gave you. You you know, friends, that there are not a handful of people in America that understand everything we need we already have in Jesus. All the righteousness of the power. I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Hold it. But I spent eight long months. And I'm going to just stop a minute and tell you how it happened. Eight months ago, nine months ago, I was walking from one building to another. We've got five on the block. Six now. We just about finished the half million dollar center for the glory of God. Oriental man stopped me on the street. Give me, give me his name. He said, Brother Dave, God sent me to you. He said, your ministry is too shallow. First thing he said. He said, God sent me from behind the Iron Curtain to tell you this. He said, you need to take a year off and get into the Word and understand the power of God. There's so many things that you haven't learned yet. You've got to get Dave Wilkson out of the way. And I got mad. I said, I'll tell you what you need, friend. I said, I'm the soul winner. And you come around here telling me, I said, that center is full of converts and God's moving, God's blessing my life. I'm preaching to six and seven thousand a week now, and you telling me that I don't understand it? I said, I'll bet you just go around telling the preachers things like I said, you need to get in the chapel and get on your knees and humble yourself. He just smiled. He was a little hurt. He walked away. I was mortified because the truth always hurts. Went to the office and the telephone rang. Some minister didn't, I don't even remember his name. He said, it's not important. He said, for three weeks, I've sat at my phone. I've been fighting against it, but I just have to do it. He said, I had a vision of you, Reverend Wilson. He said, I don't know much about you, but God told me to call you, and I've got to obey it. He said, you were standing before thousands of young people, one of your crusades, and they all walked out on you. And you went to the edge of the pulpit, and you fell over dead, and you fell in a hole. And I went and looked in the hole, and everybody said, Dave Wilson is dead, and he was in his old clothes. He said, now, I don't know what that means. 
And I tell you, I just about had it. I, I yelled at him. I said, I'll bet you're a homosexual or something, and you just taken a vicarious thrill out of humbling me. They said, get off this phone and leave me alone. Hmm. I went home. This double barrel attack hanging heavy over me, and I went to prayer. And God began to break through and said, I sent them both. I sent them both. Cancel all your crusades. Cancel everything. And stay in this room until you begin to understand the kingdom of God within you. Until you begin to see the power there is in Jesus Christ. Until you dip, lengthen your cords, go deeper in the Lord. And it was in this process, eight months I tried, prayed, Lord, show me the crucified life. I've got to have a power of definition over sin. And I prayed and I strove and I fasted. I studied the lives of the great missionaries who spread the gospel around the world. And I found that they were fighting the same battle that I was fighting, that God never used one of them until they suddenly had a revelation of the power over sin that a man can obtain, that a man can live in complete victory in his life, not subject to these things. I studied the life of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor had been used of God to send some 200 missionaries to China, raised up China Inland Mission, one of the greatest missionaries in the world. In the midst of this, when God was using him, Hudson Taylor cried out. Suddenly I felt the ingratitude, the danger, the sin of not living nearer to God. He said, I prayed, I agonized, I fasted, I strove, I made resolutions. I read the word more diligently. I sought more time for meditation, but all without avail. Every day, almost every hour, the consciousness of my inner sin oppressed me. Now, this is a great missionary talking. It was known around the world. I knew that if I could only abide in Christ, all would be well, but I could not. I would begin the day with prayer, determined never to take my eyes off Jesus throughout the day. But he said, at the end of the day, my catalog of sin would increase. My position became continually more and more responsible. My needs greater for special grace. And I continually mourned that I followed Jesus at such a far distance, and I learned so slowly to imitate him. He said, I can't begin to tell you how buffeted I am by temptations. I never knew how bad a heart I had. Who's talking? One of the world's greatest missionaries, who suddenly saw revelation of himself and his weakness and his frailty. I never knew how wicked, how bad a heart I had. I knew that I loved God and I loved his work and I desired to serve him in all things. And I value and precious his lovely name. But often I'm tempted to think that one so full of sin as I cannot even be a child of God at all. He said, please, friends, pray that the Lord will keep me from my sin, will sanctify me wholly and will use me largely in his service. I listened to the, to the pitiful heart cry of this missionary and other missionaries, and I realized that they fought the same battle. Others who say, I've walked with God for so long, I'm too intelligent to have to face such immature kinds of temptation. I should have passed this plane long ago. You can walk with God for 25 years. And suddenly be cast down into a kind of temptation and face a battle in your life that you thought you would never be called upon to fight. You thought you were too far along the road. Have you fully persuaded yourself that you want to sell out to God? That you want to resist all the pressures of this age? You want to become a true overcomer? Yet in spite of your resolutions, your determined will... Your keen desire, your praying, your fasting, your seeking, you still must honestly admit that sin often overwhelms you. Things that you despise, you end up doing. You feel almost like it is an inevitable force that pushes you into moves and actions and indulgences of the mind and the body. Things that you hate. And then you wind up perplexed, your soul in turmoil, and you end up with an indescribable wretchedness and despair. Paul the Apostle knew something about this kind of wretchedness. Romans. What I hate, that do I. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. 
Paul was seeking a definition of power over sin. Say what you will, I believe Paul faced the same battle that you and I face. He said, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Paul was a wretched man until God gave him the same spirit of revelation of power over sin in his life. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, I don't want to get into a deep theological discussion about the two natures and about the deep meanings to be found here. Suffice to say that I believe Paul the Apostle is speaking for himself about his own personal battle and his own quest for deliverance and power over sin. And from backsliders and from saints of all ages, from David Wilkerson, from Hudson Taylor, from the lips of every dying prophet of God, from Paul the Apostle included, this cry has gone out through every generation. Where is my power over sin? I have seen my sin and my bondage. Who shall deliver me from my wretchedness? Who will set me free from the body of this death? Now, my friend, if you have not yet fought this battle, you are still an immature Christian. This is a battle of prophets. This is a battle of those who seek the deeper things of God. This is the battle of those who want to go all the way with the Lord. And if you've been walking with God, this message already comes very, very close to describing the very battle you fight right now. I thank God that there is deliverance. Man does not have to be a slave to sin. You do not have to live your life in bondage to the habits of a sinful urge. There is a way out. There is deliverance. There is power over all sin. It's not enough for me to tell you that all power over sin is in Christ Jesus. No definition of this power will work in your life and mine until we learn how to get this power out of him into us. Listen to what Hudson Taylor said. He said, all the time I felt assured that there was in Jesus Christ all I needed. All power over sin. All victory in him was the richness and fatness of heaven. But the practical question was this, how to get it out of him? He was truly rich, but I was poor. He was strong, but I was weak. I knew full well that there was in the root, the stem, all the abundant fatness, but how to get it into my puny little branch was the question. Yes, my friend, Jesus Christ has all the power over sin. And I want you to know something else, guidance, divine guidance is a person. It is Jesus. Guidance is a person. Victory over sin is a person. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But how do we tap that power for our own lives? When a man faces a battle and he wants a definition over sin, what does he do? Does he pray more, fast more often, make resolutions, try to be better? So we try to work up feelings of righteousness and seek something of an outward holiness. Hudson Taylor did. He said, I prayed, I fasted, I strove, I made resolutions. I read the Bible more diligently, but with all, all without avail. Every day, almost hour, every hour, the consciousness of sin oppressed me. I knew that if I could just abide in Christ, all would be well, but I could not find out how. My friends, absolute power over all sin belongs only to Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is he who has come to destroy the works of the devil. All our power over sin depends entirely on our faith in his promise to live his life through us. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. He didn't say, I'm being crucified every day. I don't believe Paul died daily. I believe he died a thousand times a day. What he's trying to say is get Paul the Apostle out of the way so Jesus can live his resurrected life through me. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, not of Paul the Apostle. Paul didn't have any faith, didn't even try to find it. Paul never looked for faith, he never tried to strive for it. He said, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. You know, they will doesn't have an ounce of faith. I haven't even been looking for it. I've never been trying to find faith because I've been letting Jesus exercise his faith through me. He knows the Father better than I. 
by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul the Apostle found that his power over sin came by a full and complete faith that the life he lived in the flesh was actually Jesus Christ living through him and fighting off the enemy. This is what Hudson Taylor found. This is what I found. But how to get my faith strengthened? Not by striving after faith, but by resting on the faithful one. Hudson Taylor went outside and looked at a tree. He saw the branch and he tried to figure out how that branch got the life out. He said the branch didn't move, never did it think. It just stayed on the branch. The very fact that it was in. The vine just rested. There remaineth yet a rest of the children of God. He said, I will never leave thee. There is your rest. You can strive in vain to rest in him. You don't have to strive to rest. For he's not promised to leave you or to forsake you. So you accept that and appropriate it by faith. Now hear me before I close. The most damning sin of all is unbelief. We make God a liar when we will not take him at his word. We lack power over sin because we toy with our unbelief. He has promised to quicken us in the moment of temptation, make a way of escape, and I've found what that way of escape is. When you really believe God's word, when you see the mighty power of Jesus Christ within you, when the moment of temptation comes, the way of escape is a quickening spirit sent by God through the Holy Spirit that will last as long as your temptation so that you can bear it. And every time I see it coming and you can sense it, the enemy comes in. We're not ignorant of his devices. He begins to plague us. Then suddenly I start perceiving Christ. And I believe the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a power of perception. Paul kept saying, oh, that you might know that your eyes may be open, that you may perceive. And this is a power of perception that Christ is here in the same spirit that raised him from the dead. And I picture that the corpse laying there in the tomb, the mighty spirit of God coming down into that tomb, picking up that body, that corpse, breathing life. And I see him rise in a new dimension, walking out of that tomb. And I try to picture all that happened in that tomb. And I picture the same spirit that raised him from the dead suddenly in my moment of temptation coming and picking me right up, right up. And suddenly in a new dimension, Satan cannot touch me. Satan cometh and hath nothing in me. Now that doesn't make me a bit better. I don't even try to be a bit better. And I don't fight anymore. I rest in his power, allowing Jesus Christ to live through us. And oh, how ignorant we are of this mighty power within us. Everybody talks about some storehouse somewhere. I've heard preachers say, oh, if I could only tap that storehouse. Here it is. It is within us. You don't have to reach out. God hath been pleased that in him should dwell all the fullness of the Godhead. When I stop to think of all the power he has given us, all power over sin belongs to him. You do not fight this battle anymore, my friends. Resign and commit it to the Lord and allow Jesus to quicken you. The same spirit that was in Christ shall be in you. The same spirit that raised him from the dead. You cannot say what will be will be. You cannot indulge in unbelief and expect to get victory in your life. You've got to stand up and declare to be to your own soul. Christ has power over this sin. Christ lives in me. Christ in me will deliver me. Christ in me will set me free. I can't fight it. It's too big for me. But Jesus has the power, so I'll rest in him. And I found a simple but sure solution. With this, I close. In my life for power over sin. I've discovered the secret of personal of power over personal sin in my life. You hear it well. It's this simple. Stay close to Jesus. Love him. Trust him. Believe in him. Commune with him. Draw nigh unto him, and he'll draw nigh unto you. The answer to all power of sin is to become possessed with Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I'm a Jesus-possessed man. Possessed. Hmm. Who are these that keep backsliding? 
Who are these who grow cold and indifferent? Who are these that revert to narcotics and their sinful ways? Who are these who, like dogs, return to their vomit to wallow? Who are these that moan and groan that they can't help themselves, that they're being forced to sin? They are those who have lost their first love. They are those who walk afar off, those who dabble in the world and who pray only in a crisis. They are not lovers of Jesus. I tell you that lovers of Jesus have found there's victory over all sin. Lovers of Jesus learn just three promises. If a man will take just three promises, any three promises in the book, and stand on it and believe it, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Rest on his word. Exercise the power of Jesus within us. You too will find your definition of power over sin. I was told last night with this, I close. Anymore, when a drug addict comes to me and he says he has no more power, when I walk the streets, whether it be a prostitute, a drug addict, alcoholic, we round them up from the Bowery and God sets them free. I lay hands on them. It's though Dave Wilson steps right out of his body and stands beside and watches the Holy Spirit minister to Christ. I just yield my lips and pray that Christ will cause that living water. You know, the Bible said, greater works than these shall you do. Who does the greater works? It's Christ himself who's come back. He's still doing the works. Only he's doing greater works now than he did then because he comes back using our bodies. He has come back. All he wants is a body. And I pray and God sets them free. And then I step back into the body and rejoice and praise him for what he did to a yielded body. And God wants you to step aside in the moment of temptation. He wants you to step out of the body. He wants you to stand aside and see his glory. And then step back in when the victory comes and rejoice in his mighty delivering power. Heavenly Father, we thank you. There is all power over sin. Glory to God. The devil is a defeated foe. He cannot touch a child of God. Lord, give us the prayer that is pleasing unto the Lord. Now, there's a, there's a kind of praying that is truly pleasing to the Lord. And let me say this. Not all prayer that is prayed today by Christians is a pleasing manner of prayer to him. And with the help of the Holy Spirit this morning... I, I just pray that God will change your thinking about prayer and how you pray from now on till Jesus comes or until the Lord takes you home in a chariot. God, speak to our hearts this morning about the true uh, prayer. Now, I, I have no intention this morning of complicating prayer. That's been done good enough by well-intentioned teachers and preachers all over the world today who, who have... Uh, so complicated prayer into formulas and into strategies. We have people now that dress up in combat uniforms and boots because they call themselves prayer warriors. So they're going to look the part. I'm not making fun of that, but I'm, I'm saying there are so many well-intentioned people that have so complicated prayer. I know people now that go into the long prayer meetings, they, they have prayer guides. They have whole books on what to do for to fill up the four hours. If you go to prayer just trying to fill up time, you don't even know what prayer is all about. I am not going to, to add to that. I don't have a one, two, three, four step uh, program for you this morning. But what I do believe I have are some thoughts on prayer from the heart of God that came uh, from the college of my knees. Let me begin by saying right now, I believe most Christians want to pray. They are convicted by their prayerlessness, and they pray for a while, but they soon stop. They can't maintain a life of prayer. And the reason for that is because they really don't understand the purpose of prayer. They don't understand the real purpose of prayer. And until you understand the purpose of prayer, I think most of us are praying in vain. You have to comprehend why God wants us to pray. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. They wouldn't have said that unless they wanted to learn. And I believe most sitting here listening to me this morning want to learn how to pray. You would pray if you knew its purpose. You would pray if there was some knowledge that God had given to you about the eternal purpose of prayer. Now, how many Christians I know pray only out of a sense of obligation? 
They, they say, well, I'm supposed to pray. The Bible says I'm supposed to pray. The pastor keeps putting pressure on us to pray. Others around us are supposed to pray, are praying. I, I have to pray. That's the Christian thing to do. Folks, what kind of a marriage would it be if the wife, uh, concerning intimacy thought it was only her duty? In fact, there are some grandmothers who taught their daughters that, uh, intimacy with her husband was a, uh, a very difficult duty. Now, I want you to listen to me very closely now because the Lord's been laying some things on my heart. There are people who pray only when there's a tragedy or when a crisis strikes, and then when the tragedy, the crisis is gone, uh, they don't pray anymore till the next crisis. But you can never, you will never understand the importance of prayer until you understand one foundational truth. And all prayer, I believe, is built upon this truth. It is not just for the good of man. It's not just for my good that God wants me to pray. It's not just for my welfare. Not for me to get relief. Not for me simply to get something out of God, to try to extract something from God. The true meaning of prayer is for the delight of the Lord as well as for my relief. Unless those two go together, you don't have a foundation upon which to build a prayer life. It is not just for my good, it is for the delight of my Lord. Come, I mean, how many of you are hearing this right now? It's not just for my benefit. I'm not going to just go to God and, 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 and intercede. I'm not just going to ask Him for things for me, but I'm going to see His need as well as understand my need. Now, Christians are very self-centered when it comes to prayer because we go to Him only to unburden our troubles and sorrows and get a supply of strength to go on to the next battle. And that's good, it's scriptural, and it works. And we're invited to come boldly to the throne of grace uh, in all of our times of need. But prayer is not complete. Now listen to me closely. Prayer is not complete. It is not prayer that's most pleasing to the Lord if we do not understand God's need. You don't go to prayer just to meet your own need. God has a need. That is why he, he does hardly anything. I, I, there's nothing you've been accomplished in my life but through prayer. And why is it that God has tied himself to this process of prayer? We seek relief and God seeks fellowship. The Lord seeks intimacy with us. Now folks, you, um, you have to understand that when you go into the presence of the Lord, that the Lord is waiting for you. The Lord is looking for fellowship. Now, Actually, the primary purpose of prayer ought to be fellowship with the Lord and the one who prays. Because most of the things that we're praying about, God's already promised to do. We are praying about things that God said we're not to pray about. He said we're not even give thought about it. How much of our prayer time is spent asking God for uh, a better job, a better apartment, clothes and food and all of these things when Jesus said, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Your heavenly Father feeds the fowls of the air, they neither sow nor reap. Are you not more valued than they? Your heavenly Father knows you have need of these things, but seek first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. Take no thought for the morrow. For your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask Him. And what I hear from that, the Lord's saying, you come to me and focus on my righteousness or fellowship. Focus on just getting to know me, on intimacy, on just loving me. And I'll take care of all your needs. Don't put your focus on material things. Don't put focus even on your healing of your body. All of these things. I know before you ask. I know everything you need. For. I've had four. I have four children. I said, I've had. I have four children. And uh, a number of grandchildren, 11. I know what my, all my lifetime, I've known what my children wanted. I've known it. He knows what we need and we spend, you take, you take the kind of petition out of our prayer life that many of us pray and there'd be nothing left. There'd be no prayer left because it is all asking, it's all petition. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the Lord said, if you want to really pray pleasing to me, come and focus on my need. Come and focus on fellowship with me. Come and focus on intimacy. I'll take care of everything else in your life. 
And I've proven that, and I believe it with all my heart. There are so few Christians who know what it is to go in the presence of the Lord with delight. With delight, simply for the pleasure of His company. This is, uh, I've had a week alone with the Lord in prayer, and this is where this message was birthed. And I want you to, I'm just praying that I can get it out to you the way the Lord put it into my heart. I'm going to ask you a question. Is prayer a burden to you? And do you pray out of a sense of obligation? Is it boring to you? Is it more of a duty than it is a pleasure? And, and this, let's this idea of, I've done it so many, we call prayer work. That work and labor, you've got to labor and pray, you've got to work in prayer. Why is it we don't say that about the one we love the most? If you, you are happily married, you love your mate, do you call intimacy, do you call those times alone work? I think we have it all wrong. The Lord is saying, why would you consider it work to come into my presence? I, I would not want to be in a marriage where uh, a wife, my wife would, would, would say, uh, she would have this mindset that it was a duty, it was an obligation. Oh no, I, it, 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 I have to have a time of intimacy. This is considered work, considered an obligation, and there's no delight in it. A man of a true uh, follower of Jesus, someone who really loves the Lord, a man does not seek intimacy from his wife simply to alleviate his own needs. That is the most hideous thought possible. And, and that either should think it's a duty or that it's work. But that time of intimacy, the man gets his real joy, he should get his real pleasure out of the wife coming to him and saying, uh, and he knows, she doesn't have to say anything, but he knows that she is there and it's a delight. It is not an obligation, it is not a duty, it's a delight. And his delight in seeing her having pleasure in his company. They just... He says in his heart, she really wants to be with me. I'm first. I'm everything. It is not a uh, burden. It is not boring. It is not an obligation. It is not duty. It's delight. She's not reluctant. She delights in him. She desires him above all others. And he reaches out in reciprocation to her because she is responding in the same manner. Now, we know the Lord delights in us. The scripture says, how fair and how pleasant art thou, O love for delight, Song of Solomon. David said, he delivered me because he delighted in me. Now, I thank God that he taught me a long time ago that he loves me and delights in me. He joys in his people. He sings over his people with delight, the scripture says. You ever, can you imagine the Lord dancing and, and, and just uh, exuberant over his children? because of their love and because of his fellowship. We know he delights in us, but do you delight in him? The scripture says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. The Shunammite said, I sat down under his shadow with great delight. Now, I've always wanted my prayers to be a delight to the Lord and a delight to me. I didn't want it to ever become work or a sense of duty or obligation or trying to fill in time and say, oh, good, God has to bless my spend three hours in prayer last night. As if God were obligated by the time I put in. He's not obligated that way. He obligates himself to the delighted heart. Now, this matter of coming into his presence with delight is not just glee or exuberance. No, it's, it's much more than that. It boils down this, and this is what the Holy Spirit told me. Delight in the Lord is simply this. I would rather be with Jesus than anyone else on earth. I would rather be with him more than my wife, more than my husband, more than my family, more than the President of the United States, more than all world leaders, more than any counselor, more than any famous person. I would rather be with him. That is the light. I would rather spend time with him than with anybody else. Now, if you can't say that, you don't know the prayer that's pleasing to his heart. If you cannot, in every crisis, say, I'll be all right, I've got to get to him. I'll be all right as soon as I get to him. Who do you go to when you're in trouble? 
Where do you go when you have a crisis? Who's the first one you get in touch with? Is it your husband? Do you get on the phone and call counselor? Some of us don't know any other voice than the voice of a pastor or counselor or husband or wife or friend. Don't even know the voice of the Lord. Who do you go to? Folks, can you imagine what it must do to the heart of the Lord when he is there waiting with all the resources, everything that we need to comfort and strengthen and empower us, and we run off to somebody else, or we sit and brood right there in his company? We just sit there and will not run to him? Folks, this delight is something that God recognizes. This is something the Lord sees. When you come to him, when, when, when everything, every day, doesn't have to be a crisis, but any time, you just, you say, I've got to get away. In fact, if you really delight in the Lord, you will, uh, everything that hinders your coming is going to bother you. You're going to say, well, I love people, but I've got to get away. I've got to spend time with him. He's waiting, and you'll get lonely, you'll get heartsick. If you, I know, I know what's happened to me. If I go a day without the Lord, without time alone with Him in, in real intimacy, I get lonesome. I get terribly lonesome inside. That, because it's a kind of lonesomeness that no human being can feel. No one can touch that spot but Jesus. Nobody. I love my family, but they can't touch what's inside my heart. I have to have Him. I've got to run to Him. And when Jesus sees you want Him more than anybody else, you go to Him first. That is the delight. Oh, I know a lot of people... Uh, I'm getting hit on myself. Oh. He wants to know that you prefer Him above all else. That is delight. Now, another thought by the prayer. Coming to Him with delight does not mean you cannot come to Him with sadness and grief. So many times I've come into His presence... I mean burdened and heavy with grief and sadness in my heart. Now remember my definition of delight in the Lord, preferring to be with Him above all others. That's my explanation of delighting in the Lord. And this is exemplified in the life of Hannah. You remember Hannah, who daily, who daily came to the Lord's presence, and she came one time to the temple, sad of heart and weeping with a sorrowful spirit. The Bible said she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Her husband shared her with another wife by the name of Penina. And Penina had given uh, her husband uh, a, a number of children, especially men children, boy, boy children. And she became an adversary to Hannah and would harass her night and day. In the scripture, in fact, uh, Hannah said she provoked me sore. She provoked me. Hannah was dearly loved by her husband, but in her sorrow, he couldn't comfort her. He said, am I not better to you than ten sons? He said, and I know in her heart, she said, you're not understanding. I have a need that you can't meet. Folks, that's one of the greatest lessons you can learn, that no human being can meet that need in you, that deep yearning, that longing, nobody. That's why so many people get married and divorced and remarried and remarried. They're looking for somebody to meet that need. That's why people run around looking for some person, some individual. They go to counselors and psychiatrists and psychologists. They're trying to meet a need there that only the Lord can meet. Nobody else can meet it. She testified to Eli, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit and I poured out my soul before the Lord. Out of the abundance of my sorrow and my grief have I spoken hitherto. She, she was not afraid to come into his presence with her sadness. See, we've been so programmed to come into the presence of the Lord with joy and gladness. Now, the scripture makes many references to coming into his presence with joy and gladness. But there's some people who will not come into his presence because they're sad, they're downcast, they're going through a trial, they're weeping and they're broken. And it's almost as if they're saying... I'll come into his presence, but I don't want to offend him coming the way I am. I'll wait till I'm happy. I'll wait till I have joy, and then I'll come into his presence. We're so used to coming in with clapping and with praising and happiness and joy. But the scripture makes it very, very clear that he wants us to come even in our saddest moments. Don't hide from the Lord. Don't run anywhere else. Go right into his presence. Weep it out before the Lord. 
Tell him everything that you're going through. Let him have your sadness. The scripture says, in this time of brokenness, Eli said, the Lord will answer your prayer. And she went away and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Hallelujah. And what strikes me is that when I am overcome with grief and sadness, there's a tendency in all of us to just shy away and say, Lord, let me work this out first and then I'll come to you. I don't want to bring it to you now. That is so wrong. I, I, I recently had a, a, a time of unexplained sadness. There's no, there's no real reason for it. It, it was not, uh, uh, what, what do you call, uh, you know, the blues or depression. It was just uh, sadness. Anybody here ever get a, a time of just sadness? You don't understand it? Now, and I couldn't understand it. And I, I tried to, I was going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I, I said, now, Lord, if you'll just wait, this might think, if you'll just wait till this evening, I'll be okay. Then I'll pray. And the Holy Spirit led me to go to the Old Testament about Nehemiah. And I hadn't seen it before. And I read this and I, it just broke me down, began to weep in the presence of the Lord and say, thank you, Lord. And I had a great time. And in a few hours, he took it all away. But I had to come to him with sadness. Nehemiah was a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes, and he tasted the wine before he would give it to the king, first of all, to see if it was poisoned. He would die first. And also to, to bring the quality wines uh, to his table. He'd become a very trusted servant to this king. But he'd heard a report, Nehemiah had heard a report from his brother, Hanana, about the ruined conditions of Jerusalem. And, and he, he said to uh, Nehemiah, the walls are torn down, the city's in ruins, the people are, uh, are in terrible straits, and, and it's disintegrating, it's getting worse every day, and it just tore his heart. He had a love for J Judah and for Jerusalem, and it carried over into his life a sadness gripped Nehemiah. And he comes to the king one day, and it came to pass... This is Nehemiah speaking. I took up the wine and I gave it unto the king. Now, up to this time, I had never been sad in his presence. I'd never been sad. And when when I read those words, sad in his presence, it, it just hit me. Lord, that's me right now, sad in your presence. The king asked, why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. And the reason he was afraid, because you dare not, by decree, come into a king's presence, especially if you were in the king's court, you dared not come in with anything but a smile. You could have your head chopped off. And now he's very afraid because he knows the decree. And rather than uh, the king chop his head off, he was moved with compassion. And the scripture makes it very clear, if you read the story, that Nehemiah is given a leave of absence. He's given letters of credit. The king's treasure is open to him, and he gets the desire of his heart, and he is told to go to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and the walls. Now, let me, here's the point. And this, all these things are written for our benefit, the scripture said, upon whom the ends of the world have come. They're all patterns for us. This whole story is about us. If, if a man of God can go into the presence of a pagan king and find compassion and have every need met, and the burden lifted so that he comes out of that king's presence with every need supplied, how much more will King Jesus supply your need, take away your burden when you come sad in his presence? Hallelujah. I looked at that and said, Lord, he's a pagan king and he has compassion. You are ever loving, ever merciful. I come into your courts with this burden. I come to you broken. I come to you cast down. I come with sadness. But folks, you still delight in the Lord because in your sadness, remember my definition of sadness is coming to Him first, preferring Him above all others. You still come with delight. Even though you don't feel happy, you don't feel joyful, the real meaning of delight is that I go to Him first. I prefer His company, the pleasure of His company. Hallelujah. Now, if we're going to learn to pray pleasing unto the Lord, we've got to learn to pray through. That's my next thought. 
Now, praying through is a term that was coined by early Pentecostals. To them, it simply meant you stay on your knees till you're sure you have the answer. You just stay there till you believe that you have the answer. And others uh, talked about uh, this term of praying through is keep coming back to the Lord and coming back and coming back until you get your answer. That is praying through. They called it persevering in prayer. In fact, when I was a boy at camp meeting, everybody prayed. I'm, they'd get up and testify, I'm going to lay hold of the horns on the altar and not let go until God answers. But folks, that's not what I see in, in the Spirit about praying through. The Lord has really changed my concept of what it means to pray through. Now, some of you talk about praying through, but let me try to explain what I've seen in the Spirit. Prayer actually is not complete, in fact, until you pray it through. Many prayers are wasted, they're aborted, they're lost because they've not been carried through. Now, I'm telling you, you you can delight in the Lord, you can go to Him and He can lift your spirit, He can satisfy your heart, He empowers you, and you feel like you're ready to face every crisis and everything else. But what happens when you leave that secret place of communion... You are not on your knees now. You are not shut in with God at this time. What happens when you leave that hallowed place of intimacy and you go back to a situation that hasn't changed? The same devil is there. The same problems are there. The same emptiness. And everything that brought about your sad condition is still there waiting to pounce on you again and bring you down once again suddenly under its power. Now, here's what I mean by praying through. What you get from the Lord when you're shut in with Him, the strength, encouragement, the empowerment, must see you through the trial that's just ahead. If you don't get it in prayer, what did you get if it doesn't see you through the problem? Is it an aborted prayer? If it does not see you through, is it a completed prayer? Praying through is waiting for the completion of your prayer till it's totally completed. Many of us have never seen completed prayers. We've seen half-answered prayers. It's not been completed. See, you can be shut in with the Lord in the Mount of Transfiguration. And you can glory in that and delight in His presence. And then you come down to the valley and the demoniacs are waiting. And the crisis is there and problem after problem, confusion after confusion. What good is it if you get the glory on the mountain and it won't see you through the battle? What you get in the secret closet, the victory you get in the secret closet has to give you victory on the battlefield. I don't want to pray for an overwhelming blessing of power and anointing from God. I don't want a a tremendous surge of assurance from the Lord in the secret closet. And that's what you get when you're shut in with the Lord. You get peace. The first thing he tells you is don't be afraid. I'm with you. And He settles your spirit and He brings joy, He brings peace. And you walk out with that glory on your face. But folks, what about the next day? What about the trial? Because most of the times, prayer doesn't change situations or circumstances. It changes you and puts you above the circumstances. And some of you get discouraged because you haven't prayed your circumstances uh, to change. You you believe God for that? Now, sometimes He does. But many times you go from that wonderful mountaintop experience of intimacy with Jesus and go right into a battle. All the demon powers of hell raid against you. But folks, it's not a finished prayer. It's not a completed prayer until you get through, until you're through the problem, through the crisis, and you come out on the other side in triumph. God fully intends that what we get with Him in intimacy is going to supply us with everything we need for the battle. And folks, if you're not intimate with the Lord and you're not seeking Him in a way pleasing to Him, how do you fight the enemy? How do you face your trials? I could not. I can't face anything without running to Him and getting my soul uh, fired up and getting the peace and the joy and the rest of God in my soul. I don't know what even Christians do who don't know how to pray according to his mind. Now, I confess that at this point I have failed miserably in the past. I've known great times of ecstasy. 
I know what it is to get lonely for Jesus even after uh, 24 hours and have to run to Him to have that wonderful intimacy with Him. And I know what it is to run to Him with heaviness and sorrow and tears flowing. And I've experienced that awesome touch that you get and you come out with relief. But then when I face a crisis, the next day or the next week, it seems to evaporate. Come on now. I think the reason it's getting so quiet here, I'm touching somebody's nerve. Mm-hmm. Oh, you had such power when you prayed. You had such an anointing. Came to church. You were blessed. The glory of the Lord was here. And then you went right out the door and all the demon powers of hell are out there waiting. You went home and your husband screamed at you, uh, yelled at you, you. Everything went wrong. You went to work on Monday and everything went crazy. And where is that joy? Where is that peace? Where is that rest that you got in intimacy with Jesus? Your prayer hasn't been prayed through. Because your prayer's not prayed through till you've lived it through. Now, what is the end purpose of prayer? Is it just to give you ecstasy? Is it just to give you rest and peace? No, folks, it's got to be a, a grief to the Heavenly Father. It's got to be a grief to the heart of the Lord that He gives us everything we need that tends to godliness and righteousness. Everything we need for life is in Him. And He gives it to us in that time of intimacy. He builds us up. And it must grieve His heart that we don't see it that way, that somehow between this glory and the crisis, we lose everything that we have got and gained in intimacy and prayer with the Lord. So how do you keep it? What, what do you do? To maintain the victory so that your prayer is prayed through to to a a triumphant uh, conclusion. What is it going to take? Folks, I I really prayed about this because uh, Christians everywhere are hurting. Uh, We we get 30 to 40,000 letters a month from our mailing list. There are over 700,000 people on our mailing list to get these messages. And folks, I've never, we've never heard what we hear now of the hurting of the people. There are Christians that are so lonely, they can hardly see themselves through a day. They have, they, they are just suffocating with a loneliness that is incredible, especially during holidays. There are other Christians that write to us, and, and it's probably representative right here of this own of our own congregation here, going through all kinds of marital problems and family problems, hurting pastors that are are grief stricken of what's happening in their congregations. Many of them write to us that they they've had people rise up against them. Some people they trusted the most just rise up against them and betray them. It's so bad I can't add to that hurt that burden. What do I do? And the Lord said, what, what, what is needed is a word from the Lord on how to go to Him in prayer, become intimate, and receive the power and the authority to go through it. A word from the Lord. Folks, you don't, I, I can't stand here and say, why aren't you in victory? Why aren't you praying? Why are you sad? Be happy. What terrible people you are. Because you shouldn't, after all these years, you shouldn't be so downcast. You ought to have victory in your life. I can't do that. Because sometimes I get downcast. And I get sad. I'm not going to be a phony as a preacher. Now this is just mashed potatoes and gravy. Old home cooking. I want, to, I want to get this out to you. I said, Lord, what do I do that I can maintain victory, take the victory from the prayer closet right through my battle, come through the other side, and then on the other side, just a time of intimacy, of praise and worship and thanksgiving for the greatness of God and His keeping, saving, delivering power. First of all, listen. Listen. That's the word he gave me. Most Christians don't listen to God. They go to talk. They go to talk. 
You go through this Bible, you, you, you look at any man that God has ever used, and he had learned to stay in God's presence till he heard his word, till he heard his voice. There'll be a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk you in it when you go to the right hand or to the left. There'll be a word behind you. Now, I'm going to tell you now, and I want you to hear it. The Lord wants to talk to every one of us. He wants to talk to the children. Like the little girl who was dying of leukemia, and she was near death's door, and she was having a terrible time even thinking of the concept of death. And uh, the, the mother came in the room the next day, and she was all aglow and happy. And mother said, what happened? She said, he said, an angel came to me and said that I, I was going to take a trip, and God came, took my hand, took me to a beautiful garden, walked me through the garden, and said, you're coming here tomorrow. It said, took all the things. God spoke to that little child. God spoke, said, tomorrow you're going to be with me. Took all the pain out of her heart. And she left, she was with the Lord the next day with joy in her heart. God can speak to children. He can speak to anybody who will give him quality time. But see, we go into his presence demanding. We go into his presence in a hurried spirit. Oh, the one thing that God wants more than anything else is quiet, quality time. It's not, it's not the length of time even, but it's getting your soul stilled in His presence and saying, now speak to me, Lord. I'm going to ask you, when you got intimate with Jesus, when you were shuddered with Him, did you get your directions? Did He tell you what to do, when to do, and how to do it? I know there are people who don't believe that, but my Bible says my sheep know my voice. They hear when I call. I don't do anything anymore. I haven't done it in a long time. I don't do anything now until I get along with him and say, Jesus, there's nobody on this earth that can tell me what to do. You're the only one who knows all things. You're the only one who knows the way through this. And I'm staying here till you tell me what to do. I won't do anything until you speak to my heart. That is the kind of praying. That is the kind of praying through where you stop and you hear his voice. And he says, now, you've got to make this thing right You've got to make restitution here. You've got to make this call. Or you just stand still till next week. I'll tell you what to do a week from now. Don't get in a hurry. I want you to sit for a week and just trust me. He will speak to you. He will give you direction. Folks, the devil cannot come in and invade that private time when you are really preferring him above all others and delighting in him in that way. And you're trusting him in faith. And then, folks, after he speaks to you, just get this word out. Stay right there on your knees. Stay in with him. And get this book and say, Holy Spirit, where do you... First of all, uh, you should have a time where you read through the book systematically. You go right through the book and mark it. But then you go alone with the Lord and say, Lord, speak to me through your word. Speak to me through your word. He'll say, Psalm 33. And I go to Psalm 33 and... and, and by the way, what is Psalm 33 here? <laughs> by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake and it was done, he commanded and it stood still. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to nothing. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death, to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He's our help and our shield. Hallelujah. See, he just spoke. He's given us a lesson. Honestly. Thank you, Jesus. Our hearts shall rejoice in him because we've trusted in his holy name. Hallelujah. Listen to him. You see, he's going to give you direction. He's going to tell you how to get through your crisis. And this is the problem. We have failed because we didn't stay to get our direction. We didn't stay to get the word from the Lord. Now, some of you are here this morning, and I'm speaking prophetically now. You have to hear from God. There's nobody on the face of this earth that's going to see you through the problem you face. Nobody. And I want you to hear this in the Spirit. I know I'm speaking prophetically. You are here this morning. You may be here for the first time. And He's speaking to your heart. 
And you hear it now in the Spirit. Don't hear it from me. Hear it from the Holy Spirit. You have got to get to Him and stay there in His presence until He alone gives you your direction. Till He tells you the way through. When to act, how to act, who to call, what to do. He will give you explicit direction. And if He doesn't give you direction, He'll tell you to hold still and He'll give you the peace to maintain that stillness until the victory comes, until the answer comes. There are some things He can't do right now because situations are not ripe. But as soon as they are ripe, in His time and His way, it will not be one minute too late or one minute early. It will be right in Holy Ghost timing. So when you go to pray now, you say, oh Lord, I come now not just to have my needs met. I come now, Lord, to meet your need. I know, listen, God created Adam and came down and fellowshiped with him every day. He wanted it. He needed it. We were made for fellowship with the Lord. Do you, do you love to be with him? I've got to close now, but what in the world? How, do, how, how can anybody say they know how to pray or have even attempted to pray if, if there's not something in your heart that every day draws you, woos you? There's no love if you don't have that drawing to the Lord. If you're not, I'm not talking about a two-minute, five-minute little prayer. I'm talking about shutting the whole world out. Say, oh, Lord, you're my everything. That's the way I praise the Lord. And Lord knows this. Lord did not know want in this world. Not its fame, not its money, not its recognition, not its pleasures. I don't want any of that, Jesus, because you've become the whole delight of my soul. I prefer your company. I just enjoy your company. Hallelujah. When you get in the car, what do you do? You begin to sing. You begin to worship. You begin to enjoy his company. Hallelujah. When everybody around you, there's busyness and you've got company, and you've got all kinds of things going, what do you do? The heart, if you really love them, is reaching out. You can't wait. I just wait. And then, then finally, you say to everybody, I'm sorry, I've got to leave you for a moment. Don't tell them you're going to prayer. That would be boasting. Just, just escape. Just vanish. Get alone with Him. Hallelujah. Do you prefer Him above all others? God, help us to enjoy completed prayers. Really praying through. Will you stand? <clears throat> now, this message won't make you shout, but it ought to change your life. It ought to affect your life from here on out. And when you go to prayer, say, Lord, I, I come for your pleasure. I come to meet you. Hallelujah. This is for your pleasure. It's a joy. I, God helping me. Now, I know the Bible said they labored in prayer. But they, there was a delight in what they were doing. I prefer not to use that word because the connotation today is obligation and duty. Hallelujah. Now, some of you up in the balcony, the main floor, You've been praying. You've been seeking the Lord. God wants you to add this one thing. Lord, I'm going to stop talking. Every time I come, I'm going to talk to you, but when I've talked out my heart, I'm going to quit talking. I'm going to quit speaking. I'm just going to sit silent and say, Speak, my Lord. Speak to my heart. Hallelujah. Folks, God wants to speak to everyone in this church, everyone in this choir. He wants you to be able to know you shouldn't have to go to somebody. You shouldn't have to come to me. You shouldn't have to come to any pastor. You shouldn't have to go to any counselor. Counselors are for those who, who, who honestly, I'm going to tell you, straight out, for those who have not yet learned his voice. There's nothing wrong with counselors. That's fine. Because there are, are new converts, there are people who have not yet learned, and that's good, and they will learn. And eventually they won't need counselors. I don't go to a counselor. Every time I've gone to counsel, I've got the wrong advice. <laughs> because people tell me what they think I want to hear. They tell me something that might uh, abort the work of God in my heart. 
No, you go to Him. He will speak to you. You know, some of you, are, you're here Seth, this morning and you're cold in heart. You have not been drawn to the Lord. You, you are, I'm going to tell you straight out, you're cold. You're cold. You're not even lukewarm. You're cold. I want you to come down this aisle and shake off that coldness and say, Jesus, you draw me to yourself now. If you, if you have a spirit of loneliness on you, if you've got a spirit of depression or anything else that's just bombarding you, you bring it to the Lord now and say, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to you. You're going to tell me how to get out of my loneliness. You're going to tell me what to do and how to do it. Folks, don't go to the Christian bookstore and get a half dozen books on how to fight loneliness. Save your money. Go to Jesus and say, Lord, what do I do? And he said, the first thing, I'm going to give you all the grace you need to see it through. He'll pour grace into you. This is the conclusion of the message. Oh